Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. The S&P is still up 1%, but if you take a look at an intraday chart, it is a nice straight line down after we got that ISM services number, Paul, when you have prices paid higher, index slipping below 50, and that employment number coming in at 45.9 uh, for the service sector, yeah. which does echo what we saw in terms of hospitality jobs and sort of the meager addition that we saw in today's jobs report. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the uh, the labor market, we had a, a lot of guests on and Bloomberg surveillance, a lot of economists. Uh, and I think the consensus kind of is it's still a solid labor market, but just cooling. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's probably uh, all maybe the Federal Reserve might need to pull maybe a rate hike, uh, rate cut, mm-hmm. well, maybe a little bit forward in the year. And if we dot together all the things we learned from, say, bookings and Expedia, et cetera, the kind of service economy is starting to slow. So let's get more with that. Uh, Anthony Nieves, uh, he joins us. He is the ISM chair services uh, head. Um, he is the chair of the ISM services business committee. Let me get that title right. So uh, talk to me about how you understand these numbers. So services index slipping below 49.4. How would you describe that? Well, what we're seeing here is a pullback in the leading indexes that comprise this composite index. Business activity, 50.9, that's down 6.5 percentage points. Still growing, but as you said, it's cooling. It's definitely uh, pulled back some. New orders, still growing, 52.2, but down 2.2 percentage points. And the employment market continues to be, uh, just as this index indicates, 45.9, down 2.6 percentage points, attributed to a combination of things that we've seen in the past ongoing. Either they can't find applicable workers for open positions or they're controlling that labor expense. And the last one, supplier deliveries, continues to be faster due to waning demand as well as improved capacity. So, Anthony, can you kind of give us some context here? Because context matters. Give us a little sense here of the of the trend here in some of this services uh, data. That's a great point. This is one month. We've contracted here first time since December of 2022. Uh, We thought it might take a little bit longer to bounce back. It came right back the following month. Not trying to be the consummate optimist here, but again, one trend. We're just under the baseline. Based on respondent comments, they indicate that they see the, you know, next part of the year that it will be some improvements there. So we'll just have to wait and see how it trends out over the next couple of months. Where are the worry spots within all the respondents? Where are the weak links? Well, it's, uh, inflation is a big one. Uh, you know, pricing is is definitely uh, impacting their various industries uh, and and their companies that make up this sector, as well as the challenges in employment. You know, construction still seems to be an area where they can't backfill positions, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, geopolitical issues as well also is on the forefront of our respondents' minds right now. All right, great stuff, Anthony. Thank you so much, Anthony Nieves. I love that you hop on with us. We know you have a busy day. Uh, He's the chair of the ISM Services Index. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. You know, there's a lot going on out there in the marketplace here. And again, it's economic data, it's earnings data. Henrietta Trez joins us, Managing Partner and Director of Economic Policy for VEDA Partners, uh, I believe from Zoom, I mean from Louisiana via Zoom. Uh, Hey, Henrietta, what do you make of this jobs report? I mean, to what extent is this labor market cooling in your mind? Well, first of all, I have to just say, the Stones played last night at Jazz Fest down in New Orleans. So y'all just come on down. Fantastic. Uh, it'll be going all weekend, so can't wait. Um, but no, the jobs number continues to be really, I think, just a Goldilocks moment. Um, the market participants are focused on Fed interest rate cuts, and this reignited opportunities and sort of optimism for a Fed rate cut in September, which is a market difference from just earlier this week. And expectations for the last couple of weeks have been pushing it out till November or even next year, or even say that there could be a Fed hike. So I think this jobs number, while slightly lower than it has been in the last couple of months, I mean, continues this 
ridiculous trend of sub 4% unemployment, which is full employment in the United States, and really just paints the picture of a very robust, strong economy um, that is the longest running since the 1960s. So I, I think it's um, sort of a perfect number, to be honest. How fast, though, can the job market cool? Um, someone pointed out on MLive, which is the great sort of blog that we do here at Bloomberg, that health and private education, uh, excluding public school teachers, accounted for over half of the entire gain in payroll. So if you back that out, it was actually a lot weaker. And so I'm wondering how fast we can cool here. I mean, I think that the ridiculous strength in job growth for the last couple of months, it's just been blowing out expectations. It's almost like where were those jobs even coming from? It's hard to sort of wrap your head around those numbers so consistently for, for what is it, 24 months or something. Um, I think that this jobs number reflects more of a reality. Um, I saw on the, on the same blog post, you know, some similar comments about the weather over the winter period, maybe just bringing this back down to earth. Um, and I think it, it reflects, you know, a very strong economy that really doesn't have much room to continue growing jobs the way that it has been. All right. So I guess when we combine this jobs print today, Henrietta, with what we heard from Fed Chairman Jay Powell earlier in the week, does this kind of alter the way you think about how the Fed may proceed uh, for the remainder of the year in terms of perhaps cutting rates? Uh, you know, I don't subscribe to the theory that the Fed is politically motivated. I know a lot of investors are in that headspace. Um, but, you know, I've worked with Federal Reserve folks for many years, going back to when I was in the Senate um, and here and work with many of the former Fed chairs, uh, former Fed uh, employees now. And I think the understanding that they are not a political animal is something that Jay Powell tries to relay over and over and mm -hmm. over again, as he did on Wednesday. Um, but, you know, investors don't necessarily all want to hear that. I think that if the Fed feels it needs to contain inflation and keep its dual mandate going, they will cut as needed. I mean, one of the things that I'd point out is that we have elections in the United States all the time. Granted, they're only every four years of presidential election cycle. But we've got generals. We've got different elections across individual mm -hmm. states, constitutional referendums. I mean, this happens all the time. So to assume that the Fed is somehow not going to cut from you know July to November because the election that's a big swath of time that they're just going to let the economy run un, uh, un unregulated you know that's not really um, how they operate and so I would just encourage folks to say you know, if they do need to cut they will um, and I think they'll do that x any political considerations one more thing I'd add is that um, there's this view that if they don't cut in March or April or even June, then they can't come in and cut in September. I've heard that repeatedly from investors. Um, and the idea being it'll look too partisan, too politically oriented. Um, and I, I disagree with that, but it's interesting to see the market move since Wednesday in today's jobs report. Now they're all of a sudden pricing in cuts again in September. So it seems to vacillate quite a bit. And I, I just point that out because I think it's an interesting dynamic from investor perspective. Yeah. I mean, even before this is already happening, they had that article last Friday, right, about potentially the Trump campaign talking about eroding that independence regardless. So there's that. Uh, before I let you go, um, the way labor market slows, when could we be in, in, in a higher unemployment environment in this election cycle? I mean, I think to your earlier point, it could happen pretty quickly. Um, you know, it's only a 3.9 now. It wouldn't take much to tick up to 4, 4.1. Um, and I think the revisions are something to watch, certainly, as well. Um, and as we get into the summer months, you talked about school teachers. Um, I, I think that there's opportunity for change. And I could imagine us being uh, higher than 4% come Election Day, without question. All right, Henrietta, thank you so much for joining us. Henrietta Trez, a managing partner and Director of Economic Policy at Veda Partners. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. I'm Alex Steele alongside Paul Sweeney. This is Bloomberg Intelligence Radio, where we bring you all the economic and financial news that you need to know with our great Bloomberg Intelligence analysts. They cover 2,000 companies and 130 industries. We also venture outside of that and talk to some really great investors who have their pulse on the market and can really understand how to position your portfolio uh, for the next couple decades, really. Carol Pepper is one of them, founder and CEO of Pepper International. She joins us now from New York City. Um, Carol, the market seems to be taking the report as Goldilocks. ISM services number might have put a little bit of dent in that. But uh, either way, does this give you confidence to buy the market? 
Yes, I mean, I think we are in a very nice sweet spot. I, I'm not necessarily one to buy the market. We look at sectors and see where the growth is going to be. So as you know, I'm a big tech bull for the long term. I think you buy tech on fear days. And the United States really leads in technology and innovation and artificial intelligence. And those sectors of the magnificent six, if you will, out of seven, are really powering the market forward and will continue to do so. I think it looks likely that you know the Fed will ease at some point this year, and that's very good for growth stocks. So I'm in a I'm in a happy place with the report. <laughs> what did you make of that uh, Apple print we saw last night after the close? Uh, what are your takeaways? Well, I just think again, it's you know everybody wants to keep counting tech out because they missed the rally, and what I tell everybody is you can't time when all the good news will come in. So mm -hmm. things are looking up for Apple. You just have to get in there, hold your nose if you're a value investor and you think everything's overpriced, because it's not if you have a long-term time horizon. As you know, I manage money for family offices, generally people with over $100 million, and we make long-term bets. And the long-term bet to make right now are the Magnificent Six. I leave out Tesla because I think they have a lot of problems. Um, but if you look at all the other stocks, these are this is a good basket, or if you can't buy all the stocks individually, you can look at QQQ. Get a broad base of American technology exposure and global technology exposure and set it and forget it, you know, and you will see continuing upside surprises. Sometimes we'll miss a quarter. Look at what Microsoft just did. They're reinvesting to buy more AI. So the earnings might be down for a quarter, but that is only going to translate into double the earnings two quarters later. So you can't just go, you know, month to month and say it's up or it's down. You have to make some long term bets if you want to make money over the long term. So if I'm hearing you right, you're saying buy on fear, big tech, because they're, it's a good value, value plus tech. <laughs> yes, it is the real value. The, the real value today is not the value stocks. The real value today are the, t the big tech stocks because they have the balance sheet, they have the cash, and they're leading the entire country because their technologies will impact every single other industry in this country. AI is going to touch everything. So if you really want to make long term money, if you want to fund your retirement or your kids education, put money in tech and leave it there. Don't try to trade it daily. It's very hard to guess which quarter the earnings are going to pop up, when people are going to be more or less fearful. But when they are fearful, like they were a few days ago, that's when you jump in and buy. So, Carol, what do you think about healthcare here? And the reason I ask is I'm looking at Amgen here. Here's a company with a $160 billion market cap company up 12 uh, percent, and it seems like in the healthcare space, if you could talk about a GLP into your portfolio, it's kind of like saying you got AI exposure and technology mm -hmm. kind of works. How do you think about healthcare? Well, I I really think that healthcare right now is being driven by the whole weight loss craze because that is a huge trend that's going to keep going up, and I do predict that eventually it might take another year. We're either going to get pills or we're going to get the price of the shots coming way down. And that will just bring a flood of new patients into the market. So that is a trend that um, you definitely want to jump on. I think for the next four or five years, at some point, the governments will put their foot down and start to mandate lower prices for these drugs. But for now, it's definitely um, a trend that will make money for you over the, the medium term, for sure, because what, most mm -hmm. of America is overweight. And this is a way to help them get their weight under control. Yeah. Um <laughs> Paul sitting his belly at this current moment. Um, uh, Carol, before I let you go, what what else do you like right now? What else do you want to buy on fear? Well, I think the main thing is just, you know, that's those are my favorite picks. I also think you should buy real estate, frankly, because real estate's going to come back. Again, you have to be a little bit patient. But if you're willing to sit through the summer, you can get some beaten up real estate uh, development stocks and home building stocks, real estate will come roaring back the second that the rates come down. The rates are going to come down. Do we know if it's two months or six months? We don't know, but we do know we're going to get there. So those of you who loved a bargain, look into the real estate sector right now. Look at home builders and, and people like that. That's really a place where you're going to be able to get in there early and uh, pat yourself on the back when the rest of the world catches on your, your trend that you got in early. All right, Carol, thank you so much for joining us. Carol Pepper, she's a founder and CEO of Pepper International, joining us from New York City via uh, Zoom here.
You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Let's get back to that labor data because that is certainly the big play here Um for the markets here, we want to always like to chat with Tom Gimbel. Tom is the founder and CEO of LaSalle Networks. Tom, uh, talk to us about this number here, a little bit uh, a slowdown in hiring, but still a pretty healthy number. What's your perspective? I'll tell you, I'm not sure that it's not actually a better number than people think if you look really? at how small the government hiring was. Ah, all but, right, break but, it down for yeah. us. So we've been averaging, government's been averaging about 55,000 jobs a month. This month it was 8,000. So when you look at the percentage of non-government jobs added, this was one of the better months. Interesting. Because I hadn't heard that. So then why is the well, why is the rhetoric like, ooh, if you back that out, the overall number wasn't that great? Oh, because economists are depressing people. <laughs> I think that I think that that in reality, um, you know, the the as we talk about every week, adding jobs is is better than losing jobs. So the economy is is good. I think where we have a, a problem that everybody knows about is inflation. And for some reason, we've got um, cost of things going up, stock market going up, but it's being driven by by the a few of you know the magnificent seven and all that good stuff. And then we're sitting here looking at 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 people working, and the labor market is healthy. Now, what we're seeing is a lot of the jobs are in healthcare and they're in hospitality and they're in construction and so those are a lot of hourly jobs they're not the highest earning jobs and we're seeing a little bit of white collar um stalling in the hiring side so tom it's uh early may that means uh kids are gonna start graduating from college what's that job market look like um it's there it's there it's just not as healthy as it was and and what i mean by that is it's the jobs aren't going to be if you want you know a lot of kids oh i want to work remote i want to work from here that you're gonna have to go into an office i think for a lot of the the jobs number one number two the salaries aren't going to be as high starting salaries as as they have been historically for recent college graduates um and number three you're not going to see as high a volume of hiring at companies so you might not get the company that you want or the job you think you want, but there are jobs available. Do you, what sectors do you still feel like are are, are pretty strong? I, I anecdotally was speaking to a friend of mine who's pretty high up in the tech sector on the data side, and she mm -hmm. is just like, I can't, it's really hard to get a job. And there have been so many rounds of layoffs over the last year and a half or so that there's just a plethora of people mm. trying to get in on the same uh, jobs at this point. Where are the jobs? Where are they not? Talk us through all the dynamics. Yeah, so I think the real challenge is is where we where I think things are going to move over the course of the next couple of years is is less industry and more skill set. Meaning, technology might not be hiring. Um, meaning, big tech companies, but people who do sales may be getting hiring, and people who do development or product may be getting hired, but they're not hiring in marketing or HR. So I think it's more of what your skill set is versus the overall industries, right? So healthcare may be stalling. We don't the nurse shortage isn't what it was three years ago. However, they're hiring um, a ton of doctors and they're hiring a ton of of medical records people as they move to AI, they still need to get the work done. So it, it, it's really in the the roles versus the industries. But if I could wave a wand and, and give myself a skill set, it would be in security, in technology security. You, mm -hmm. you guys see the hacks that Microsoft had a couple months ago, mm -hmm. and there's a new one every week or every month coming out. And if somebody is really talented in the, in the cyber security space, that ain't going anywhere. Hey, Tom, I wonder from your perspective <clears throat> how the influx of immigrants, legal and illegal, into this country yeah. and the surge it's been, um, how does that impact? A lot of folks are saying that's been a net positive for the labor market and the economy. What do you see from your perspective? I, I, I don't necessarily see that yet. So I, I think on the legal side, the problem with the layman, as, as you guys know, is, is people think that, that 
um, coming in is is purely south of the border for for immigration and and legal immigration is is people who want to get married or they're just going to move here. We we educate. There's different laws for uh, non citizens to come into the country to be educated at a lot of our best schools, and then you you have to leave after that. And so the legal immigration of educating people and then not allowing them to work here especially in technology fields and engineering, the, the STEMs, right? It, we, we have this population, we educate, and then we send away. It's almost an, uh, a non what this country was built on methodology. And then, and then number two, on the illegal side, I think the negative on the workforce isn't that we don't need people at, at an entry level and blue collar skill set. It's a matter of, of how it's um, affecting society and what businesses want to do and people being scared and and where things are at and it, it overloading the system on some social issues and that has ripple effect into corporate America that's that's my concern and then the, the last thing you know I, you know it's the third rail right but I I think I was doing an interview the other day about how you know we're seeing an influx from our clients at state schools doing finance and consulting recruiting because they don't want to just touch the Ivies with a 10-foot pole well, that's really interesting. Yeah. What what what's the yeah. why there? No, I think there's you you, you have a, so it, it, you have a smaller uh, student population base at the Ivy Leagues. So companies don't want to spend their time trying to 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 look at social media and figure out who's in the protesting, who's not, who might have been abusive to other students, who wasn't. Right? It's easier to say, you know what, we're not going to discriminate against people within the Ivies. We're just not going to recruit from the Ivies. It's really right. interesting. Tom, so what's kind of your view here uh, as it relates going forward in terms of how do you think this labor economy is going to evolve for the, the, the remainder of this year? I think it's going to continue to be um, be fine. I think what we have is, um, you know, this intersection, this Venn diagram, if you will, of where it meets of of the the overall stock market uh a change in in washington dc with the election potential change with the washington dc with the election coming up um and then and then just where we're at with inflation and and things like that and so and interest rates and so what we got today is to me it doesn't seem like the fed's going to lower rates and and if that happens i think the status quo continues and i think it's going to be just this emotionally purgatory world we're going to live in for the for the next six or eight months okay but let's let, let's game that out so that's the fed not cutting rates if the fed does cut rates are do the companies and industries you talk to how would that influence their hiring oh most it, it really depends right 25 basis points you know not that much it, it what it what it does is people what it'll do is if it has the desired effect that a lot of people in corporate america think which is send the the economy back into a hyperdrive state, then they'd continue to, the theory would be they'd continue to lower interest rates. And then when money got cheap enough, you could hire people in the in the classes of 20, 50, 100. But I don't think 25 basis points in uh, the next or two two sessions from now is gonna all of a sudden turn 300 or 400,000 jobs a month. I don't see that happening. Hey, Tom, is there any regionality out there into the hiring market? Um, I, I, I'm just guessing, you know, Texas, Florida going crazy, but is there any regionality out there? No, I think you're, you're right on the red states. Um, we continue to see Nashville. We continue to see um, it, Birmingham and Alabama and, and cities like that and, and, and the, the, the triangle in, uh, in North Carolina yeah. just being a hot sector. But no, I think other than that, it's, I do think you're, you're starting to see a little bit of it, of it move in from the coasts. And I just think that's more of social issues than anything else. So it's where companies will go. I mean, look at, I, I read an article, I'm, don't quote me on it, but, but that, that uh, Goldman Sachs has more employees in Salt Lake City than they do in New York. So yeah. I think that tells you that second and hmm. third tier cities are, are definitely a place where corporate America is going. And we're going to Nashville. Well, we are going to Nashville. Yeah, I'm yeah, super yeah. excited. I booked I my hotel and I booked the airfare. Okay. So this is big for me. Water slide to die for. I'm water slides? Yeah. Oh, it's a water park. Aren't we a little it's too old for that? Oh, no, we, no, no, no. we go. Water we go park. to this. Okay. Big, there we big. go. Bloomberg Intelligence on the road from a water park. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Tom Gimbel, founder and CEO over at LaSalle Network. Thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, all of that for you. But that's so interesting. It's like... 
you know, when you stay on the West, the West Coast or the East Coast, you forget that there's a lot of building happening, particularly uh, in red states, particularly from oh, some yeah. of the infrastructure bills uh, that we've seen. And irrespective of that, yep. there's still a lot of build out uh, as well. So that's actually quite interesting. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We bring you all the news in economics and finance, and we bring it to you through our lens of Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst. They cover 2,000 companies in 130 industries worldwide. They've been doing it for decades, and they are really good at what they do. So on that point, we want to go to Anurag Rana, Bloomberg Intelligence a Senior Technology Analyst, to give us the breakdown for Apple earnings. So we're looking at the best rally in almost 18 months from Apple. Stock is up by 6%. I should point out that the S&P is really starting to roll over. We're now up only eight-tenths of 1%, so we'll see how long the rally in Apple lasts. But Anurag, what was the biggest standout that justifies the rally for you? Yeah, when the results came out, you know, I, I remembered a quote from late Charlie Munger that the secret of happiness and a successful marriage is uh, low expectations. So I think this is exactly what happened with Apple that, you know, people going in were like so pessimistic that any bit of good news was just hailed with, uh, you know, the stock reaction that you're seeing right now. So Anurag, you I guess before the print, you were talking about what you really want to hear regarding China and their business in China was stabilization. Stabilization. Did you hear that? In fact, he said they were doing very good in China, which is contrary to every data that out there. In fact, a couple of analysts this asked asked him that, like, you know, how do you reconcile with all this data on shipments being down versus your comments in China? He's like, I'm not responsible for them, but. We are doing okay in China, so it's it's a big dichotomy right now in the market as to you know who to believe, whether the third-party data providers are that are that are talking about a massive decline in, in in iPhones versus Apple that's saying you know China is okay. Did you like them spending the hundred ten billion dollars on a buyback? I'm guessing you didn't because Paul was into it. No, actually, to be very frank, they spend over about hundred billion right now, so the hundred and ten is a minor upgrade. You know, the, the real news would have been if they said they're going to do about 150, frankly. So I, I think I know the headline number looks really big, but they do already spend currently close to $100 billion buying back, you know, their share. So, I, I, I mean, I like it. There's no problem about it. But, but I think that's not really what got the stock going. The fact that they said that they're going to grow in, you know, low single digits after for F about, a, you know, 200, or close to a 200 basis points, uh, you know, impact on FX. That's, I think, the biggest news at this point. Hey, Anurag, I guess the uh, their developer conference uh, coming up in June is going to be big for Apple. Um, from an AI perspective, what will you be looking for uh, at that conference? So, I mean, my personal preference would be if they do a tie-up with Google and use Google's model to run some of those stuff. Because, the, you know, the, there is a big uh, unknown out there as to what's going to happen between their relationship with uh, Google when it comes to the default search engine. And Google, you know, supposedly pays them $20 billion for it. I think that's under a lot of regulatory scrutiny. If Apple were to refine and do another deal with Google where they can, you know, mix both those things, it will really help their AI cost because I don't think organically they can do something this quickly. Um, there are news by Mark Gurman that they're going to either tie up with Google or OpenAI. You know, my preference would be if they, they tie up with Google over there. So what is that risk for Apple from Google? It is there, but to be honest, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a one or a zero, which means we, there's no way to predict which way the judge is going to go. Um, but I also feel that if, they, if this does come down to that, you know, some kind of a legal issue, the two parties are willing to pay each other. Or, you know, there is a transaction there. So they'll find another way to make it look less like that, you know, a payment for default search engines, maybe per click. Or there's some, there could be some economics there, but it is a headline issue, uh, at least in the near term for Apple. I have to say, Anurag, you do not seem that thrilled, uh, or that you you don't you don't seem that thrilled after Apple's quarter. No, 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 no that's that's not true. I mean, I I'm I'm very happy with the you results. You seem skeptical. I'm actually really, skeptical. How about that? No, I I, I, I no no not at all. I'm relieved of what happened from last night. I just need to get to some of these one or two different things that are pending. 
Because see, at the end of the day, Apple is one of the most phenomenal companies right now. There is nobody with an ecosystem that's stronger um, in the retail world or in the consumer world. Um, but the question is, how do they get back to the growth rate and can they get rid of some of the regulatory hangups right now? Their fees is under a lot of pressure, both in EU and perhaps even in the US. So, so there are a few things, you know, it's not a clear cut story as a Microsoft or an Amazon uh, or an NVIDIA at this point. There, there are certain things that need to be cleaned up, but uh, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always a big fan of Apple, <laughs> nothing about it. All right, very good. Uh, Anurag Rana, thank you very much. We appreciate that. As always, Anurag Rana, technology analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.